thanks for watching and welcome to Pass Physiology Review of Topic 5, All About Muscle. This video will focus on the muscle reflexes and sensory receptors and then get into a comparison of skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle tissue. In your face. To begin with, on my study guide on the right, you can see that this is the second page of the study guide I've posted and at the top there's a box comparing spindle fibers, nuclear bag and nuclear chain. Below it is a box with the uh, basic reflexes in a table sort of simplified uh, highlighting the, the big ideas. Muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs and then this flexor withdrawal reflex as well. So let's just look at this middle box first to get an idea of muscle spindles compared to Golgi tendon organs and then we'll come back up to the specific spindle fibers. Muscle spindles are classified as intrafusal. Okay, an extrafusal muscle fiber would be the type that is contractile. These types of muscle fibers. What they are are specialized skeletal muscle cells that act like receptors. They don't act like contractors. Okay? They don't functionally uh, contract within the sarcomere. They just uh, they respond to the contraction around them by the rest of the muscle. They're little tiny, like two millimeter long um, sensory organs, basically. Okay? And they're going to be within your muscle belly. They are going to be encapsulated by some connective tissue, quote unquote spindle shaped connective tissue. So a spindle is, I'll draw it on the screen, it's kind of like this, okay, on both sides. So um, I'm not sure how to describe that, but if you look over here on the left, this is basically the shape of a spindle where it's wider in the middle and then it tapers off at either end. This picture on the left here, out of John Kiera, figure 1014 in the 13th edition, uh, this is showing you a muscle spindle right next to a Golgi tendon organ, uh, but the size is grossly exaggerated on this muscle spindle. It's larger than it would be, and you probably wouldn't have these two organs so close to each other. Um, the muscle spindles are located in the muscle belly, which would not be right next to the myotendinous junction uh, where you would find this Golgi tendon organs. But they put them next to each other so you can just sort of visually get an idea of what they look like next to each other, I guess, okay? <clears throat> so, this is a muscle spindle here. Spindle-shaped uh, specialized muscle, muscle fibers. And then it's all around it are going to be regular skeletal muscle fibers. So when these other skeletal muscle fibers are contracting with the rest of the muscle, they're going to be putting pressure on this spindle uh, and providing some proprioceptive input back to the central nervous system. So if we come back over to the table, some things that you'll want to know is that yes, it does have actin and myosin at the ends, okay, not in the middle. In the middle are these nuclear, nuclear uh, as in nucleus in the middle, okay. So there are nuclear 1A and type, type 1A and type 2 sensory fibers or primary and secondary sensory fibers in the middle and those are going to be uh, found in either bag or chain arrangements okay we'll come back to that soon but they're going to fire this little check mark is like firing kind of like an action potential they're going to fire and send off information to these sensory nerves shown in green on the picture over here these are afferent sensory nerve fibers that are coming in and innervating and wrapping around uh, and communicating with these muscle spindles. And what happens is that tension from stretch or length change from contraction in this muscle are going to trigger a response and basically send that information up the afferent nerve fibers uh, back through the cord to the brain uh, for reflexes and uh, unconscious movement control and things like that. They're both static and dynamic responses that you'll need to be aware of as part of the muscle spindle. And if we come up here, you can see that I've put them in a table. Static responses are shown in yellow here, because I guess slow goes with yellow, like at a stoplight. 
Okay, uh, static basically is a slow, sustained, a long response as opposed to a dynamic response. Putting green as in rapid, green, go, you go, go, go fast through the green light, okay? So if you look at this table, this is all about spindle fibers. And you need to basically be able to separate and identify what goes with what, as opposed to nuclear bag spindle fibers and nuclear chain spindle fibers. I made the bag brown, okay, brown bag and silver chain, okay, if color helps you at all. Uh, the nuclear bag fibers are going to have primary sensory fibers. So with the nuclear bag arrangement, you're only going to have primary sensory fibers. And you're going to have the only dynamic or rapid response, okay, will go with the nuclear bag, okay. Shown in blue in this table is going to be the sensory component of the bag and chain response, whether it be static or dynamic. So this is basically saying primary fires continuously proportionate to the degree of stretch, the stretch degree, okay? So primary, primary sensory fibers will fire continuously in proportion to the degree of stretch. Continuous as in slow, sustained, static responses. There's no motor component to the static response in the bag arrangement. There is a motor, gamma D, gamma dynamic motor response, okay, that's going to counter length changes quickly, okay, with this dynamic or rapid response where, the, where this primary sensory fiber in the nuclear bag will fire off during a length change quickly for a quick response from this gamma dynamic uh, motor response, okay. So if you come down here and look at the nuclear chain, the chain is going to have both. There will be two types of sensory fibers in the nuclear chain arrangement, primary and secondary. Yeah, you could also call them 1A, type 1A and type 2 in the chain, nuclear chain arrangement. And this is where you'll have your static, sustained, slow response uh, motor component. The gamma static fires proportion to the degree of stretch continuously, slowly, over a long period of time etc. This little triangle means change. So gamma s, this is motor. Red is always going to be in motor in my notes. Uh, when I take notes in you know, CNS and PNS classes and uh, anatomy classes, I've always made blue, uh, a blue pen to describe sensory things and uh, a red pen to describe the motor innervation um, if that's something that's good, that you would like to apply to your own studies, it's sort of helpful. So back to this though, the gamma static motor response will fire proportionate to the degree of stretch change or the change degree in stretch. Basically, if you can just nail down that there's a static motor response in the chain complex or in the chain arrangement and a dynamic response in the bag arrangement, uh, then you should should be okay. Now, how are you going to keep all this straight because none of this really makes sense, you know, upon just looking at it? Well, there are a couple things that can help you remember this. One is just the fact that uh, which fibers go in which bag or chain, okay? <clears throat> so I've always said one in the bag, two in the chain. If you think about it, the chain has to have two links to be a chain. So if you kind of just lock your fingers together and make a little chain, one, two, Primary and secondary to form the chain. There's one. There's one in the bag, and two in the chain. Okay, so that can kind of help you give you an give you something to to help remember which sensory fibers go in which. One, two, two in the chain, and just one in the bag. Now, as far as they both are going to have a a static sensory component. Okay. The chain will have the only static response, okay? They each only have one motor component to them, right? So the static motor component, the static motor response is in the chain. The dynamic motor response, okay, the only dynamic response, sensory or motor, really, goes with the bag. So I like to think of not only one in the bag, two in the chain, for how many uh, sensory fibers are going to be in each arrangement. But I think of this. Greens in a bag. Okay. 
You can imagine any type of greens you want going in any kind of baggie you want, whatever sticks in your memory. But if you just know that one in the bag, two in the chain, and the and what else is in the bag? Greens in the bag. Okay, so greens as in green as in go, green as in rapid, rapid as in dynamic. Okay, maybe that connection will help you. One in the bag, two in the chain, greens in the bag, greens as in rapid, rapid as in dynamic response. Okay, so maybe that'll help you. I hope so. Finishing up with the muscle spindle, a real basic thing uh, that maybe we should have started with, but we can go right across and compare it while we're at it, is the fact that the muscle spindle is going to utilize a two neuron reflex pathway. In a way that you can just kind of uh, keep this straight compared to the Golgi tendon, which has three neurons in its reflex pathway, is that it's the number of neurons is the same as the number of words, okay, which is really nice. So muscle, spindle, one, two, two neurons. Golgi, tendon, organ, three neurons, one, two, three. Okay, so that's kind of nice. But don't get confused by the number of synapses, because remember that a synapse is the communicating junction between two neurons. So a two-neuron pathway would also could also be called a monosynaptic pathway, okay? And the three-neuron pathway could also be called a disynaptic pathway. Two synapses between the three neurons, okay? So going back to the muscle spindle, it's a two-neuron muscle stretch pathway or monosynaptic pathway. The muscle, and therefore the spindle, will stretch. That'll create a dynamic response in the bag. Okay, That'll go to the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, it'll synapse with an alpha motor neuron, Okay, an alpha motor neuron of the homonymous muscle of that same muscle and then that is going to cause a contraction which will decrease the stretch to a normal or static position of this spindle okay so basically the spindle stretches the response goes through the cord uh, this could also happen over a slow period of time okay you could you could substitute in a continuous response okay, in, uh, in something more like a postural muscle, perhaps we could imagine. But to keep it simple, the spindle stretches, you have one of these responses which fires off uh, a nerve impulse okay, through this nerve fiber, okay, sensory fiber, to the spinal cord where it synapses in the cord with uh, a motor neuron in the cord, not all the way to the brain, just in the cord, it's going to synapse with the motor neuron to that same muscle where it comes right back, uh, and it will change the basically change the contraction uh, towards whatever goal your body needs basically at that time. Okay, so basic functions that it's going to do if you need it to contract synergistic muscles to work with it, it can do that, and if you need to relax opposing antagonist muscles, it can do that. Okay, in a voluntary contraction. So if this spindle is in your biceps brachii and you're flexing your elbow, it's probably going to send some uh, send for some help to contract synergists in elbow flexion, like brachialis, or uh, if your hand is pronated enough, brachioradialis. Okay, and it's going to assist in uh, that synergistic elbow flexion motion while also synapsing on neurons to relax the triceps, okay, so that your triceps aren't fighting your biceps. It's also going to help stabilize postures, especially with a high level, level of motor activity, and then also smooth and dampen out muscle action for appropriate movements uh, and coordination, and so that you're utilizing the right amount of strength to get the job done and not fighting opposing muscle groups in the body.
So if we now turn our attention to the Golgi tendon organs, you can see that uh, I've sort of spelled out your course note description uh, in fewer words. And on the left, you see this picture and John Kier's description of them. But what they are are little bundles of collagen fibers with a connective tissue sheath. Notice both spindles and Golgi tendon organs are going to have a connective tissue covering around them. Okay, the sheath is what uh, is used to describe them in the notes. Capsule is what's used to describe them. Uh, is, is what is used to describe a spindle. Regardless, it's a connective tissue uh, covering for both of them. But the Golgi tendon organs are apparently a little bit simpler. They're a bundle of collagen fibers in that sheath, and they're going to have these 1B sensory fibers wrapped around them and woven through them and it's going to be between muscle and tendon fibers at the myotendinous muscle tendon junction. So if you go back to the muscle spindle, they have nuclear, okay, as in, in the core, in the middle, they have nuclear primary and secondary or 1A and type 2 sensory fibers in the middle of them. Okay, um, The Golgi tendon organs are going to have something that you might describe as wrapping. Okay, that's how in this course they're described. In Junkiera, uh, on the left here, it's described as it says a similar role is played by Golgi tendon organs compared to the spindle. They're smaller, they're encapsulated, and they enclose sensory axons penetrating among the collagen bundles at the muscle tendon junction. So penetrating among the collagen bundles or wrapping around the collagen fibers, okay, um, different ways to describe it, but both of those are uh, valid for the Golgi tendon organ description. They're, they're located at the myotendinous junction. That's very different and easy to distinguish from muscle spindles, which are located in the muscle belly. Uh, this picture over here shows the Golgi tendon organ at, you know, what you could imagine as the muscle tendon junction, okay. The size is all out of whack on this picture, though. Uh, it's showing that this muscle spindle is proportionally way too big. If the tendon's this big, this muscle spindle should be absolutely tiny, but, but it's just kind of showing you in general. Spindles are in the muscle belly. Golgi tendon organs are right where the tendon meets the muscle, myotendinous junction. So what these Golgi tendon organs are going to do with that 1B sensory fiber, and, and a way that's maybe not so clever, but it's something to help you remember 1B Golgi, okay? So it rhymes. So 1B Golgi, I don't know if that helps, but maybe it does. 1B sensory fibers, 1B Golgi. They will fire with tension from stretch or contraction. Uh, whether No matter what's going on, there's going to be a force change at this location. And they're going to respond to it. It's going to have static and dynamic responses that you don't need to know in detail. Uh, obviously, the spindle fibers have static and dynamic responses that you do need to know a little bit of detail about. So really, they have a lot of similarities, but they're built differently, and uh, they have different numbers of neurons. Muscle spindle, one, two, two neuron pathway. The Golgi tendon organ is a one, two, three neuron reflex pathway. The basic steps would be that the muscle contracts. This would increase tension and, and tug on those Golgi tendon organs. This 1B sensory fiber is going to fire off and send a uh, send an impulse to the cord where it will synapse with an inhibitory neuron, or in, inhibitory interneuron, excuse me. That inhibitory interneuron will go forth and synapse with the alpha motor neuron of the homonymous or same muscle and inhibition prevents further contraction which leads to relaxation and then also further inhibition of synergistic muscles and even the contraction of antagonistic muscles kind of the opposite of the muscle spindle they're going to do this to protect the muscle belly and the tendon from damage from too much uh, pressure too much uh, tensile force okay and it's going to also equalize contraction, contraction strength of various fibers within a muscle for a smooth, efficient, coordinated, balanced muscle contraction. So you might have to choose uh, in true-false or something like that. You might have to 
narrow it down to something basic like true or false, gold G10 and organs function to inhibit, okay, or stimulate muscle contraction. You're going to want to go with inhibit because that interneuron, okay, that, uh, that middle, that second neuron of this three neuron pathway is an inhibitory interneuron. So it is going to inhibit further contraction. Okay, so just kind of imagine that this is a Golgi tendon organ, and this this muscle is is contracting super super hard and strong, and it's about to rip. This Golgi tendon organ feels like it's about to rip this tendon or or rip this thing open. So it's like, hey, you need to relax. So this thing fires off because there's too much tension. It fires off to the cord. Okay, so zoop, one. Okay, that's your primary. Uh, your that's your first order neuron of the pathway, the 1B goal G. It'll go off to the cord. At the cord, it'll, it'll uh, synapse with the second neuron of the pathway, which is the inhibitory interneuron, as in between neurons. And then that inhibitory interneuron can only inhibit. So that inhibitory interneuron is connected to motor neurons of that same muscle. And it's going to, when that inhibitory interneuron is uh, is basically told to fire, it's going to pass the message on to that motor neuron of that same muscle, which will inhibit further contraction so that this thing stops contracting so that there's less tension here at the Golgi tendon organ. Okay, and then beyond just that, you know, that same muscle, it can, it can act on synergists and antagonists in the opposite fashion of the muscle spindle. So, put it real simply, Muscle spindles will increase contraction. Okay, muscle spindles will stimulate. Okay, further contraction of that of that uh, of the muscle that's doing the work. Okay, obviously it's not going to stimulate the antagonist, so it's going to stimulate uh, more contraction, and it's also going to stimulate synergists and relax antagonists. While the Golgi tendon organ is going to inhibit contraction of the same muscle and inhibit synergists but also contract the antagonist okay, to, to uh, relax tension on this point. So if this is biceps, it's relaxing biceps, but the Golgi tendon organ is relaxing biceps, relaxing brachialis, and stimulating triceps to extend and, and uh, counter too much flexion here, okay, or too much contraction. So this is kind of more about the Golgi tendon organ is kind of more about protection from overstretch and damage, but it can also kind of equalize uh, the contractile forces. Muscle spindles basically just recruit for more efficient, stronger contractions, but also uh, for stability and, and smoothness and, and co coordinated muscle activity. Like if you're running or walking or performing a, uh, you know, any type of movement involving muscle activity. So they're kind of opposite. Okay, so just know, be able to compare them, um, compare and contrast these two, and you should be good to go. The flexor withdrawal reflex is pretty straightforward. Um, I've spelled it out in the uh, in black and gray. So in, in black, it's just sort of listing what happens, and then in gray, it's like giving you an example in the real, or in the real world of, of how this might play out. Um, so, you have a stimulus, you have a flexor contraction, and the body part will move away from that stimulus. So, like, fire burns your right hand, your right biceps brachii contract, and then that will flex the elbow and withdraw the right hand from the fire. Next step is that you have diverging neural circuits that are going to spread that reflex to synergistic muscles. So those diverging circuits might recruit the right brachialis and brachioradialis to further uh, flex at the elbow. And it's also going to have reciprocal inhibition where antagonists are inhibited. So you're going to have right triceps brachii and anconius elbow extensors relax. So they're not fighting the biceps flexion. Okay. Then you're going to have an after discharge that's going to prolong the contraction. So in here, haha, I put after discharge leads to exaggerated contraction, 
after the burn while you shriek in pain, okay? Maybe that's happened to you before where you kind of uncontrollably like hold the body part close to your hand after a pain stimulus, um, especially a cut, I think, um, at least in my experience. I don't know. Maybe I've never been burned well enough, but okay or bad enough. And then lastly, you have the crossed extensor reflex. So the uh, contralateral limb will extend if there's a moderate, if there's a strong enough stimulus, basically, with a moderate to strong stimulus a little bit later, okay, so like 0.2 to half a second, seconds later. So if it's just an itsy bitsy stimulus that's not, you know, so bad, you're not going to have this contralateral limb extension. But if it's a bad burn or a bad cut or whatever, then that opposite limb is going to extend out real quick, okay? So maybe that's to kind of, well, it is to a reflex to kind of catch you because if you shift your weight real quickly by rapidly, you know, flexing your right elbow and bringing that weight towards the midline um, to protect you from falling, your left arm extends out. Uh, and then maybe a better example really is if you apply all of this to uh, your leg. So if your stimulus is like stepping on a sharp object or something, okay, your hamstrings are going to flex your knee to move your leg away from the stimulus. And then certainly, that's going to lead to this crossed extensor reflex of your left quadriceps extending the knee uh, to, you know, basically lift you off the ground and to kind of make up for that, that weakness maybe, okay? So we'll run through this. It's pretty straightforward. You have a stimulus that causes flexion and then withdrawal from, from the stimulus. And then you're going to have, uh, obviously, antagonists inhibited and synergists recruited. But then at the end, the opposite limb will uh, extend. Okay, so pretty straightforward. Kind of makes sense. If you need to, motion through your own body to get familiar with that process. Um, otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, lastly, we're going to look at a comparison of the three different types of muscle tissue. You're not getting into a lot of detail uh, on smooth muscle tissue and cardiac tissue. Um, everything that's on here make sure that you that you do know okay um, but really there's it's more complicated in the skeletal muscle uh, content but we need to look at this okay so Joan Chiara has an even better table um, that can can break all this down and I'm gonna get to it if I have any luck over here I don't remember where, where it's at in the chapter as a little review we are using chapter 10 um, it's showing you skeletal muscles in the beginning, and it's going to show you cardiac. Here we go. Here's the table. Okay, so they're kind of similar. Similar. Um, there's more details in the Junkyera table. Uh, I only put what's relevant to your notes, uh, what's in your notes on this table. So if you want further ex explanation, use the Junkyera. Otherwise, you're, you're not going to need to know the size necessarily, the length of these different muscle fibers. But if you want to know, they're in here in Junkyera. Okay, so we'll just kind of run through this and then go in a little bit more detail, uh, and we can look at uh, pictures of cardiac muscle uh, to clarify this stuff, etc. Okay, so skeletal muscle we've gone over in detail. Something I haven't really mentioned explicitly, but you hopefully should know it by now, is that skeletal muscle has multiple nuclei. Um, this is from myoblast fusion. Remember, blast, uh, blast to build, to, to make, okay? So uh, anything that's blast means something that makes something. Myo means muscle, so muscle building cells, myoblasts. Those fuse, and since uh, they fuse, that means that you have a nuclei from each cell, so there's multiple nuclei in skeletal muscle cells. But you can see, uh, just even on any, any good illustration, um, you're going to see that this whole thing, right, is a cross-section, a chunk of one muscle cell, and it already shows you three nuclei, right, these purple things, these purple blobs around it, uh, the multiple nuclei. Make sure you know that. that it's, I'm sure it'll come up, if not in your Palmer courses, it'll come up on board somewhere, somehow. You need to know that skeletal muscle uh, cells have multiple nuclei because it's different. So they have this sarcomere arrangement, you know that. Actin and myosin, uh, thin and thick filaments, the whole um, the whole thing here, okay. Know this whole sarcomere arrangement and the contraction process, the, the power stroke with that cross bridge linking between uh, the myosin head on the uh, actin binding site, okay. Um, 
so that whole thing, okay? Arrows up means that some that one of these has the most, okay? So skeletal muscle fibers uh, or skeletal muscle cells have the most sarcoplasmic, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And in that sarco sarcoplasmic reticulum, we're going to have all those cisterna where all that calcium is stored inside, okay? So calcium inside uh, for contraction, therefore we have lots of sarcoplasmic reticulum. If you drop right down to cardiac muscle cells, they have less sarcoplasmic reticulum. They don't have those cisterna storing all that calcium because the calcium for uh, contraction is going to come right from the extracellular fluid, but it will still travel in via the T-tubules, which this picture on the left does a nice job of detailing. You can see these little holes on the outside of this branched, uh, striated, okay, um, striated as in with these bands, okay, kind of like, um, kind of like skeletal fibers, but this is a cardiac cell on the left, okay, and it's linked together, these cells are linked together through these intercalated discs, which we'll come back to, but it's labeled on here, openings of transverse tubules, right here where my mouse just clicked, okay, these little holes are like little pores, okay, little openings to the outside extracellular fluid, and these are the openings to the T-tubules, and so calcium will leak in from the extracellular fluid, uh, leak in into these cells for contraction. The cardiac cells do not have their own little cisterna, uh, which is modified sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, they don't have their own internal source of calcium. They get it from the extracellular fluid. Make sure that you look at this picture enough times for this to sink into your mind. Make sure that you highlight this note over here because it's different and it could be testable. Calcium comes from the extracellular fluid, but it still travels through T-tubules, okay? This is in comparison to skeletal muscle has those cisterna with calcium stored up inside of them, okay? Maybe you want to write that on this blank box on your notes uh, so that you can compare that and have both of those in front of you, okay? So back down here to the cardiac uh, muscle cells, I've got a little picture here, a better picture on the left. It's a striated appearance. It has one nucleus, one nucleus from one mild blast, okay, so one mononuclear. Um, it has less sarcoplasmic reticulum because it does not have that same internal storage of calcium. We already talked about that. It will have lots of mitochondria, though, and lots of T-tubules. Lots of T-tubules make sense because it's deliver. It's still getting all its calcium from the outside, so um, you know it's contracting all the time. So it needs lots of calcium. So it's going to have a lot of T tubules. And since your heart is always working, working pretty hard, it needs lots of ATP. Therefore, it's going to have the most mitochondria producing ATP energy all the time. Something unique that you're for sure going to see in multiple courses as a test question is this concept of the intercalated disc. It's a special gap junction between cardiac muscle cells. On the picture on the left here, you can see that it shows this little jagged border between uh, a branched uh, cardiac muscle cell with the next one. It's a special junction that bonds them together. Okay, It's where these cardiac cells connect to each other. What they do is they stick the cells together, but they allow action potentials to travel between each cell so that the whole thing, so that all these different cardiac cells, you know, there'd be, what, millions, I guess, all linked up through these gap junctions, through these intercalated discs. They, they, they link the, the cells together, but they have openings that allow nerve impulses to pass between so that your heart uh, can function as this quote-unquote functional syncytium on the top and on the bottom. There are two functional syncytiums in the heart because your heart, if you think about it, it goes lub dub lub dub lub dub and you're hearing your right and left ventricles and right and left atria contracting together, okay? So you have an atrial functional syncytium that basically pumps blood into the ventricles and then you have the ventricular functional syncytiums that pump blood from the right ventricle into the lungs and from the left ventricle into the aorta and into the body. But you have two functional syncytiums. So what that is is network simultaneous contraction 
of all these different heart muscle cells, okay, and what makes it possible are these intercalated discs, okay, they are a form of a gap junction, uh, these desmodomes is, is, or desmosomes, excuse me, that's basically what links the two sides together, um, the word gap junction, there's many different types of gap junctions, but the intercalated disc is a specialized gap junction. It's basically just where these two meet. It passes the inter it passes those nerve signals together. You're, this is probably going to be a short answer question, so I'm spending extra time on it. you got to know intercalated discs are unique to cardiac tissue. And what they do is that they link cells together and allow uh, simultaneous contraction. They create the ability to have functional syncytium operation in the heart. Okay? You're also going to see functional syncytium uh, in smooth muscle, um, in this uh, single unit type of smooth muscle that we'll get to soon. But you do not have intercalated discs in smooth muscle. It is only in the heart, only in cardiac tissue. So make sure that you know that this is unique to cardiac tissue. Okay, moving on. And also I use red because I guess red or pink or whatever color this is just kind of goes with the heart. Uh, little little Valentine's Day hearts and stuff are always red. Your heart's red in your chest, whatever, okay? So now on to the smooth muscle, which I made green because, like, green guts and goo and bile and whatever, okay? So I don't know. I just chose green. Uh, it also contrasts nicely with red. So what you've got here are two different types of smooth muscle that you need to know the difference and where they're located in the body. And then I've also got a little illustration over here of the side polar cross bridge for the spiral type of contraction and smooth muscle. Um, anything on this little green part of the chart is going to be testable. It's all kind of unique stuff, but there's not too much to learn, so uh, it shouldn't be too bad. So you can see the first little, uh, the top of this picture on the left here says multi-unit smooth muscle. The bottom is single unit smooth muscle. Right away, you can see lots of little threads going to this multi-unit smooth muscle. These are individual nerve, uh, individual nerves, okay, innervating each of these different cells. Because each of these different smooth muscle cells uh, are innervated separately, multi-unit, multiple uh, nerves making up one unit, okay? As opposed to the single unit smooth muscle will just have one nerve innervating uh, each group. So all these smooth muscle cells that are bundled together, they're all going to work together as a functional syncytium contract, contracting upon the stimulus of one okay, nerve supply, basically. Okay, We'll see if we can pull something up in junk here over here, too. I don't think you have great illustrations, but uh, you do have something. Okay, So here's 1021 smooth muscle contraction. Um, and you can see the spindle type, spindle type shape Okay, of the uh, of the muscle cells, they have one nucleus. Okay, fusiform is another word to describe a spindle shape, but we're talking about this sort of uh, I don't know double teardrop or almost like a pine cone. Okay, spindle as in it tapers off on both ends. Okay, it has one nucleus, same as a cardiac cell. It has these things called dense bodies in the cell, uh, in the membrane between intermediate filaments that's going to form a framework. In this picture, you can see these little blobby things are the dense bodies. Um, let's see here. The diagram shows that thin filaments attached to dense bodies located at the cell membrane and deep in the cytoplasm inside the cell. Dense bodies contain alpha actinin or thin filament attachment. Dense bodies at the membrane are also attachment sites for intermediate filaments and for adhesive junctions between cells. This arrangement of both the cytoskeleton and contractile apparatus of the smooth muscle cell allow the multicellular tissue to contract as a unit, functional syncytium style, providing better efficiency and force. Okay, so these dense bodies have uh, little filaments attaching to them from every direction, basically. So it has, uh, basically, the cells connect to each other by these dense bodies, and the framework within the cell connects to the dense bodies. So external forces will, will, will insert on, okay, so external threads and external forces from the movement of those threads are attached to the dense body, as well as the internal forces and internal threads 
are attached to those dense bodies. So they're involved in movement and they're getting manipulated. And when this whole thing uh, goes, this does this spiral um, network contraction. This dense body is getting tugged on and attached to from from inside and from outside. Okay, so basically, it's a it, it helps form a network between all these different filaments. Okay, so you need to be able to at least associate that dense bodies are attached to by filaments from every direction, and that it, it helps form a framework for more efficient contraction. If that's a short answer, um, try to get something like that. Okay. As far as basic characteristics of smooth muscle, you do not have transverse tubules, T-tubules. It is not striated, thus it's called smooth muscle. Okay, it's not striated. You don't have bands like you do in cardiac cells, okay, and skeletal muscle cells. Uh, you do not have the, uh, you do not have this sarcomere arrangement. I think I skipped over this, but cardiac cells do have sarcomeres, okay. So, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle have a lot of similarities. They both have those bands uh, of striation. They both have sarcomere arrangements, which create that band appearance. Um, smooth muscle is quite different. There's no deep tubules. It's smooth, there's, so there's no sarcomeres. It also has very little sarcoplasmic reticulum. And like cardiac tissue, cardiac uh, muscle tissue, it's going to get calcium from the extracellular fluid, but not through the T-tubules, okay? It, it gets them from something else, just little, quote-unquote, calcium channels in the cell membrane, okay? So you're going to want to know those those differences because you might get a true-false question like, true or false, smooth muscle, uh, smooth muscle cells receive calcium for contraction via ex extracellular fluid through T-tubules, that's false. They don't have T-tubules. They just have these calcium channels, okay? So you have T-tubules in skeletal muscle. You have T-tubules in cardiac muscle. You do not have T-tubules in smooth muscle. So make sure you know that, all right? More characteristics of smooth muscle uh, are gonna be that there are no sarcomeres, but you still have actin and myosin it's just not in the sarcomere arrangement. You do have actin, okay, but you do not have calcium binding troponin. You have calcium binding calmodulin, okay, which is associated with myosin, okay. So you have actin, but it's it's actin does not work like it does in the sarcomere. Instead, it's smooth muscle. You have the thick filament associated with calmodulin. Okay, and calmodulin triggers contraction when calcium binds it. Okay, so something that may help you remember this, I don't know. Um, calcium binds calmodulin. Well, first off, CA, CA. Okay, there's two CAs in there, so those go together. And the word calm, maybe you could make go with smooth, as in smooth muscle. Because if you feel calm, Calm is kind of a smooth feeling as opposed to a rough feeling, okay? Or if, if everything's smooth sailing, then you got to be calm. Then, then you must be calm. Or if there are smooth seas, like on the ocean, right? Smooth seas, the sea is calm, okay? Maybe that helps you. Maybe not. Maybe you have a better way. If you do, please let me know. But otherwise, it's in front of you here to memorize one way or another. That myosin is associated with calmodulin, which binds to calcium in the contractile process. Okay, actin, the thin filaments, are going to be attaching to dense bodies in the cell membrane, shown in this picture over here. And then you've got your two different types of smooth muscle arrangements, multi-unit and single unit. Multi-unit are unconnected cells. They are insulated from each other by collagen. Uh, and they have innervation by one nerve, solo innervation is what I put here. You're going to want to know uh, examples of where you're going to find multi-unit, unconnected, solo innervated, smooth muscle cells. They will be found in the iris of the eye, in the sphincter and dilator pupillae. They will be found in the erector pili of the skin that gives you goosebumps, raises your hair up. They're also found in your airways uh, and in your biggest arteries. Okay, which could be you know, aorta, I guess, right? So your um, 
the large arteries. So know these examples of where multi-unit uh, is found, okay? As opposed to single unit, it's, it's easy to remember single unit because it kind of just makes sense. It's the GI tract, okay? So if you can know for sure what single unit is and that it's found in the GI tract, then you can at all remember that iris or erector pili or airways or arteries were the other examples, you know, having to do something with smooth muscle, then you should be able to make that connection that it's it's not the single unit because the single unit is also called visceral, okay, smooth muscle, which as in visceral as in your guts, okay. There are muscle sheets of lots of these different cells all connected together. They're connected together by gap junctions, not intercalated discs. That's a special type of gap, jun gap junction unique to cardiac tissue, but there are, in general, gap junctions, okay? Ja gap junction is a uh, generic term for uh, an intracellular connection, okay? There are different types, and you'll learn more about them later, but there is a gap junction connecting all these different smooth muscle cells in a single unit grouping, and those gap junctions, just like the intercalated disc, these gap junctions will allow uh, a simultaneous contraction to create a functional syncytium, okay, for the digestive process. So in your hollow organs, you'll have two sheets of muscle that will contract basically perpendicular to each other. So I show you a line this way and a line this way. Okay, and in your stomach, you have the same arrangement, but you have three sheets of smooth muscle tissue. Uh, you know, your stomach can kind of churn and stuff and do weird stuff more than your intestines, which just kind of squeeze down and push it along. Your stomach has three sheets, which squeezes down, pushes it along, but also has an oblique twisting type of uh, contraction. This is something unique, which makes it a good test question. The stomach has three sheets uh, of muscle, of single unit muscle tissue, as opposed to like the intestines, okay, we have two sheets. So single unit smooth muscle, okay, one nerve intergroup, inter innervating a big group, all the uh, all those cells are connected to each other with gap junctions, which just like intercalated discs in the cardiac tissue, they're going to allow the passage of uh, of the stimulus for contraction between them to create the functional syncytium to allow for efficient digestion. And the unique type of contraction in this smooth muscle is going to be the concept of the side polar cross bridge, which this diagram shows you where you have an oblique arrangement and sort of a twisting uh, twisting contraction. Um, the big idea of smooth muscle in general is that it's kind of, it moves kind of slow, uh, but it's energy efficient. Okay, it kind of works on its own, it moves kind of slow, but it's energy efficient so that you don't have to waste a lot of energy just to use your energy as in food. Some more details on smooth muscle contraction in black here are that just in in general, it's regulated by a number of things. Nerves will regulate smooth muscle contraction, especially multi-unit, because there's more nerves, right, involved with it, because there's one nerve per cell. Uh, hormones, degree of stretch, chemical environment, like oxygen and CO2 levels, as well as the pH, all those things will have varying effects on uh, smooth muscle uh, contraction. So be able to list those. That's all the really the detail you need to know. You're not going to get into like exactly, you know, which hormones do what in this course, but in general, those are associated with regulation. And then lastly, some more detail on the contractile process from left to right. Calcium will enter the cell from the extracellular fluid and bind calmodulin. Remember, it enters from the ECF, the extracellular fluid, not from transverse tubules, but via these calcium channels. It'll bind calmodulin, okay, calcium binds calmodulin on the myosin, okay. Uh, down here, a little note about it, calcium channels, instead of T-tubules, calcium channels, they open slow, they stay open longer, and the calcium removal pumps are slower. So it's slower, but it's also more efficient, it uses less energy. The next step in this process is this enzyme myosin light chain kinase activation. Then you have the phosphorylation of the myosin head light chain. That myosin light chain will be dephosphorylated by myosin phosphatase. Okay, kinase and phosphatase uh, opposite uh, functions. 
which you can draw some knowledge from uh, cell bio class. Next step is going to be myosin head will bind actin. Okay, kind of like in uh, what we learned as far as skeletal muscle contraction, the myosin head will bind actin, uh, but you won't have the same type of uh, sarcomere uh, contraction. Okay, you're going to have the myosin actin cross bridge cycle. Okay, and it will be a slower and a longer contraction cycle which is more efficient, it uses less energy. And then this myosin actin cross bridge cycle will repeat through this oblique type of spiral contraction. It'll just keep going until calcium is depleted. Okay, so that's it for this study guide. I hope it was helpful. Uh, please go back and review the other video on skeletal muscle uh, and use Junkiera. At the end, on uh, page 211 of this is gonna be the summary of key points. It's great to go through and read the summary and tie things together. Uh, there are also going to be questions on the Brightspace page that you can use to uh, quiz yourself. So thanks for watching and have a great day. In your